I didn't realize that there were still some left to go. So I wanted to hop on the computer today, it's Monday when I had a little time, and answer all of those questions that you guys were so nice to not only ask, but to do a super chat. So let's dive right into them. First and foremost, we've got Randy Records 63. Randy, thank you for the super chat. The question, how do you manage properties from afar? How do you find renters? How do you find a handyman that won't fleece you when they realize you're miles away? It all boils down to property management. You have to find a good property manager, and that's the trick, and that's where the work comes into play. But just like we would find a stock and do research. We do hours and hours of research to make sure that we're setting up our portfolio in a way that's going to achieve long or hopefully achieve our long term objectives. We've got to take some time out of our schedule and find good property managers as well. You have to fly out there. You have to interview them. I've actually got videos on how I personally interview property managers to make sure that you're kissing as few frogs as possible, <laughs> which you absolutely will do. If you wanted to use Hartman's service, jasonhartman.com, check that out. He kind of pre-screens the property managers for you. But it's definitely something you can do on your own, especially if you're an entrepreneur or a former entrepreneur where you've got a good eye for reading people and uh, figuring out what vendors are going to do a good job and be there over the long term. And from a vendor standpoint, from a property manager standpoint, they want your business. So it's a it's a win-win for both parties if they can keep you on board as a customer if they can, but now some a lot rip you off but you you can find good ones and that's the key. I found a a good property manager in Kansas City. I have good property management in Columbia. Everywhere where I own property, I've been able to find someone that's acceptable. That said, it doesn't happen overnight. And I've had to go through and I've had to hire and fire a lot of property managers to get to one in each area that is acceptable. And then you have to, to, to manage them periodically. So, uh, But again, a lot of people look at buying stocks as just kind of this passive thing. And I think if you're doing it passively, you're you're not doing it as efficiently as you could. So I think there's gonna be homework involved regardless of whether you're setting up an equities portfolio or maybe a bond portfolio or a portfolio of real estate. Okay, Marcus, thank you for the super chat. Great show, greetings from Germany. Do you see a crash of the Euro within the next 18 months? Marcus, it depends, a crash compared to what? Are you comparing it to the dollar or are you comparing it to local food prices in Germany or local car prices? I'm assuming you're comparing it to the dollar. And do I see a crash of the euro? See, what's interesting about the European Union is, is you have negative interest rates. And I just did a video today, you guys can see it tonight, where I kind of argue that negative interest rates reduce or over time can reduce the velocity and, and the M2 money supply. And again, it, it doesn't always happen this way, but if that were to happen in the, you'd see, you could see price deflation and if there's fewer euros, then it would depend how much euro debt, how much dollar debt. Boy, there's a lot of moving parts right there, Marcus. <laughs> there are a lot of variables. I, I don't see a crash of the euro. I mean, could it go down to parity? Sure. But I don't know if it's not going to be cut in half in my opinion, or um, that's, I shouldn't say it won't be cut in half. Anything is possible, but I, I don't think it's probable that you see a crash, although I do think you could see a, a decline in the euro relative to the dollar. Shotgun, thank you for the super chat. Where can we find charts that show inflation in housing, stocks, etc.? Your thoughts on Vegas housing market, just non-cash out refi, 
264 at at a 2.75 interest rate. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I I that's that's cheap debt. <laughs> I'm assuming you're getting a fixed rate. And if you can get a fixed rate at 2.75, wow, that, that's fantastic. So let me focus more on your, where do I get charts? It, it's just Google. I just, I, I think I went over this earlier in the live stream or yesterday's live stream where I just, I can't tell you how many times, pretty much a day, I go to Google and type in historic chart XYZ ABC adjusted for inflation and it's it's oil it's gold it's housing it's 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 stocks it's 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 just everything that's where i start and just through google i'm able to find pretty much a well, almost 99% of the data and the charts and the graphs and the figures and the information that i use in my videos just google search My thoughts on the Vegas market, I'm kind of indifferent. It's it's not as much of a bubble as it was in 2006. I would say the U.S. is as a whole, but I don't think Vegas is. Vegas hasn't gone up that much. Is it cheap? No. Still not cheap. I don't think the RV ratios are very good. So I, I, don't, really, I don't really have an opinion on it. That said, if you can find a motivated seller and still get a 1% RV ratio, then I like it. Everything's a function of price at the end of the day. Revival305, thank you for the super chat. How do you find charts? Wait a minute here. <laughs> I think, okay, Revival, I just kind of answered that question. Revival says, how do you find charts specific home Adjusted for inflation, resources, how do you determine real price of house? Just There's the one chart I always use. It just pops right up. Just Google home or housing prices or home prices, U.S. adjusted for inflation, and then click images, and there you go. It, it might not be the first one, but you just scroll through a little bit, and you'll find it. It's 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 pretty easy to find housing charts, and if you want some more extensive housing charts, you might want to follow Danielle DiMartino Booth on Twitter. She's really in the weeds with the real estate market, not only residential but commercial, and she often throws out a lot of good charts as well. But again, just simple Google, you can find almost all the information you need. Zach, thank you for the super chat. If you have a $1.5 million net worth in cash, what percentage would you want to put in gold versus Bitcoin versus keeping in cash? So I, I can't give you specific investment advice, Zach. I can tell you what I would do with 1.5 and I'd, I'd buy 150 in gold, physical, that's my insurance. Boom, I'm done. I would take 150 and I'd I'd go into speculations. So if 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 your favorite speculation or the only thing that you would personally consider as a speculation would be Bitcoin. I, I like some others just as much, if not a little bit more. But if you're just a Bitcoin guy, then I'd do 150 grand in Bitcoin. And then I would take the rest of the 80% and put it into assets or try to find assets, whether you can do it now or that might just be a longer term game plan for you in order that pay you to own them. As far as the cash position that I would have now it would probably be different than consistently. Consistently with that type of portfolio for me, I'd say maybe 300 in cash, but right now I'd probably have more cash. Not probably, I would have more cash. Assuming that I had a, enough cash flow coming in from my investments to pay my bills, because that's one thing I really, really do not like is when I've got 
to dip into my savings or what I've accumulated or my portfolio in order to pay my living expenses, that that's like the worst thing for me. So as long as, and, and you can do that two ways, obviously through the amount of money you have coming in and then managing your expenses. Obviously one thing I do is I don't spend too much time in the United States. Now I, I probably spend a lot more than most people do even living in the United States just because I travel so much. But if I didn't travel, living here in Medellin, Colombia, oh my goodness, You've, with, let's say 80% of your portfolio, let's say you had 500 in cash, so 80% of your portfolio is 800 grand. I mean, even at a uh, 5% or 7% return or cash flow on that positive cash flow, so let's say you're just getting 50 grand a year. I mean, in Medellin, 50 grand a year, oh my goodness. You're, you're, you're living the high life, my friend. <laughs> uh, you, you would be, you'd be all set with 50 grand a year. That's for sure. So that's the other way to, to manage it, of course. <clears throat> so I guess my, my answer generally, I, I'd like maybe 250, 300 because you never know when you're going to get a bargain on something, especially if you're a real estate guy and, or gal, but with the right now, obviously I, I I'm, I, I, my base case is the markets go down a little bit further with the Cervasa sickness. So I'd like a little bit more in cash, call it uh, maybe five, 600, something like that. Now, let me, let me think through this because if I had 500, then I like to kind of keep the cash separate from the portfolio. So if I had 500, I'd probably only have a hundred because now you're investable or what you have invested is a million. And the way I set up the portfolio, it's really 10% of what you have invested, not necessarily your whole portfolio. So if you've got 500 in cash, a million invested, then I'm at 100 speculative, 100 uh, physical, and then 800 investment. And uh, again, to be clear, because this gets nuanced, I'm not saying that you, you go all in a, with 800 right now to get stuff that pays you. You, you, might, you gotta wait for good deals. You, you gotta buy cash flow when it's cheap. And if there's nothing cheap right now, you can't buy it. That's why you gotta hit the pavement. You gotta do the work. You gotta do the homework. You've gotta, in the States, we call it drive for dollars. Here, outside the United States, you have to walk for dollars. <laughs> People just put, uh, everything's kind of consolidated and like in Medellin, everyone lives in an apartment complex. So you just have to walk around the neighborhood and look for for sale signs in, in the windows because not all of it is online or actually a very small percentage of the apartments for sale are online. So I, I, again, it's hard for me to just say this much, this much, this much. I think hopefully you can take away my thought process and you can make a, a better decision for yourself on how to allocate the 1.5. Emilio, thank you for the super chat. Hello, George. Would you recommend Portugal as a safe country when it hits the fan? I, I don't know, Amelia. I, I don't. And it depends on what you consider hit the fan. If you're talking about massive social unrest, no, not at all. Then I like the Caribbean islands, like I said earlier in the live stream. Um, now you might be able to get some cheap real estate. Now you might be able to get some good cash flow. But I, I don't know. It depends on how you define it hitting the fan. So I, I don't think so. I don't think I'd consider it a safe country for that reason. When you look at it like like a, a long volatility play, like we were talking about earlier with the Dragon Portfolio in Chris Cole's paper, Allegory of the Hawk and Serpent. So I think that's my final answer. <laughs> like like where the, the Jeopardy or whatever. Yeah, that's my final answer is... Uh, I would not consider it a safe haven in the context that we've been talking about, but you could, there could be some good deals there currently when it's, when you're talking about real estate. 
Rups, thank you for the super chat. No financial advice, but would you sell a 30, 350K euro house in Spain in a good neighborhood to have cash ready for what? It depends on what your RV ratio is. So if you're getting 300 or 3,500 euros a month in rent, May probably not. I'd just set up a line of credit against it that I didn't have to use, therefore I didn't have to pay for, unless stocks or, or whatever asset class you're looking at drops so much that it makes sense to use the equity in your was it a house? Yes, in your house to to, to buy the assets or the cash flow because they're so cheap. Again, I don't suggest everybody doing this because I, I'm not a I'm not a big fan of just leveraging up to the hilt. But in some circumstances, it can be very prudent if you know what you're doing. That's how I'd probably do that. Miguel, thank you for the super chat. What gets us into trouble is what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. Yeah, yeah. Who said that? I, I I've heard that. It's Thank you for everything, George. Step number two. <laughs> uh, thank you, Miguel. I appreciate the super chat. Coleman, please interview Alistair McLeod. I'll look into it, Coleman. Always looking for suggestions. I appreciate it. KK, Silva, thank you for the super chat. Hi, what if China goes to war with Taiwan? What? Well, Taiwan's got problems. <laughs> that, that ain't going to happen. Now, the U.S. might step in there and it'd be China against the U.S. But if it's just China against Taiwan, I don't think Taiwan stands a chance in that one. But how will economic, how will economic will look? Let's see, if China goes to war with Taiwan, hmm, I'm not sure exactly what your question is. Maybe you're asking what will be the economic knock-on effects or maybe the, the, the systemic effects from that from an economic standpoint. There's so many variables there. It's just impossible to know. I'm trying to think of like a, a macro theme that, that would be probable. You know what? Probably inflation in the U.S. Because you, you'd be, you'd most likely be getting fewer goods from China. It goes back to the supply thing we always talk about. And potentially, it, it depends with what though. And I'm not going to say inflation for the United States. I'm just going to say it could create further tailwind for inflation because remember there's cross currents there so it's it's not that it, there's just always a current of deflation or always a current of inflation there's kind of currents of both happening at the same time and it's a matter of trying to figure out what is what's the strongest cross current right now or for whatever time horizon you're looking at So uh, other than that, dollar would most likely go through the roof. And isn't that interesting? So you might have some consumer price in, or a tailwind of consumer price inflation in the U.S. while demand for dollars outside the United States continued to go up. Gold probably goes up. Silver goes up. Miners go through the roof. Not sure oil. I mean, initially you'd want to say there'd be some tailwind in oil because, just because of you've got so much uncertainty, but it's not really focused around oil producers. So I think that's what I'd go with. I, I'd say probably the dollar would get some tailwind, consumer price inflation in the U.S. would get some tailwind, as would gold and silver. And, and probably bit oh yeah probably Bitcoin as well 
because you'd have a lot of Chinese just trying to get money out of China or Taiwan as fast in any way they possibly could. So that, yeah, yeah, that would probably give some tailwind to Bitcoin as well. Okay, John, thank you for the super chat. Odds of the S&P going ballistic to 4,000 this year in an inflationary scenario. I don't think it's likely just because inflation, if the inflation you're talking about, John, is 10% or less. If you look back through history, it's kind of a, a misnomer that we assume, if that's the right word, it, it, it it's not really accurate that if we get inflation, the stock market always goes up. Look at the 1970s and the stock market from 72 to 74 went down by approximately 60%, while at the same time, we had substantial consumer price inflation. So it, it doesn't always work that way. Where you always see the stock market go up is in hyperinflation. So if we get 25%, 50%, 75% inflation, then you're gonna see the stock market go up, for sure. So the question becomes, do do I think, or what are the probabilities of us getting hyperinflation in this year? Very, very low. I mean, unbelievably low. So I would say the odds of the, the S&P going to 4,000 this year due to, strictly due to uh, inflation, is 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 almost nil but but it, it's possible um as far as the s p going to four thousand because of capital flows that may be a different story capital flows like overseas capital flows not just capital flows because everyone is so worried about inflation they're trying to just get their dollar in some sort of hard asset even if it's an equity i'm talking about things hit the fan so much outside the United States, or if interest rates go negative enough, to Brent Johnson's point, then you have capital flowing into the market, which increases prices of stocks because you have a limited supply of, call, it, call them goods, meaning stocks, and you have more money chasing it. But I, I don't know if I see it happening as a direct result of inflation, especially if it's under 10%. Micro Business Media, thank you for the super chat. Great videos. I've been looking at some older videos. I like how you've been numbering the episodes. No comment needed. Okay, cool. I appreciate it. And I'm assuming you're talking about the Rebel Capitalist show. So I just kind of treat it like a podcast. We'll definitely keep numbering them. And I appreciate the, the feedback. It's good to know. All right, guys, those are the Super Chats. That concludes Sunday. I appreciate you guys tuning in. And if I didn't get to your Super Chat when it was live, I sincerely apologize. Hopefully, you were able to see the answer to your question on today's video. Appreciate you guys watching. And I'll see you on the next video.